Thanks. 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 Thanks.
there are a few things that we have to say about all of these. So the first thing I want to say is that Simmons has been getting some attention around a very innovative um, effort that we've made in graduate education in moving some of our programs online. Library information science has been online probably longer than anybody else has been. So we've had courses that have been taught online, and we are currently bringing the entire MSLIS online. And so we're doing that over time, but the faculty have been moving those courses forward, and it's one of the important innovations that we've been undertaking. We also have online programs in other schools, and those have helped us to get some of the kind of attention that we've gotten. But Simmons was recently recognized in Forbes, universities gone innovating because they recognized five institutions that the Clay Christensen Institute at Harvard identified as the five institutions that are leading the pack in innovation around online programs. So we're pretty proud of the fact that that innovation is happening at Simmons and that it's happening right here in SLIS. I'm gonna spend a lot more time on academic redesign and what we've been doing because I know as alums you receive emails and they're all kind of at this high level that feels maybe a little bit amorphous and I want to get down to brass tacks and actually show you exactly what it is that we're going to be doing. So when I came to Simmons almost four years ago, right around the same time Dean Agles came, one of the things I asked myself very quickly is we are so small as an institution do we need to be so complex? And I was kind of staggered by the fact that um, we have very uh, narrow uh, programs, many of them extremely important and signature strengths, but not connected in as many ways to each other as they could potentially be. And my feeling was, could we, and the deans were all game, they were all saying, yes, help us to make the kinds of linkages across different schools. But it felt like the whole place had been built for um, uh, vertical alignment and not for horizontal alignment. And so we started asking some questions about what our true signature strengths were and how we could kind of put some stakes in the ground around those signature strengths. And I'm not going to, you know, mince words about this either. We wanted some sustainability. Um, part of the being too complex was about being a little too large, you know, to have, you know, a, about uh, 1,700 undergraduates and 3,000 on the ground graduates, or maybe more like uh, 2,500 under on the ground graduate students, and to have five schools and all the apparatus that went along with that, and to have those schools all be, as I said, so vertically focused. Was there a way that we could think about this that would help us to have not only um, different stakes in the ground around signature strengths, but also to ensure that we would have a sustainable structure. So we started a process of thinking about whether we could reorganize ourselves to better highlight our signature strengths. And among the things that we, this, that we looked at was just, well, well, what's our current organizational structure? And you can see that the way we looked at it, it's, it's very, uh, very much siloed. You have the provost's office, and then you've got these different schools or colleges that report in to the provost. So that's our current organizational state. But our actual organizational state was even a little bit more fragmented than that. It was more like, you know, a hub and spokes that the deans all report into the provost's office, but there weren't a lot of incentives for the deans to um, find ways to collaborate with each other, to do that more horizontal thing. And so as we looked at that, I started thinking, is there a, a different way we could organize? Now, we, what we did is we had all kinds of sessions on campus where people were able to say, here are all the programs that we have. They were given a little stack. This was the creativity of Dean Abels that um, led us to this uh, way of doing things. A little stack of post-it notes, all of them pre-labeled with the programs that we have on campus, every program that we have on campus. And people were invited to say, if you could organize this place differently, how might you organize it? And we ended up with 54 different models for how we could organize Simmons. We looked at the 54 models, we said, okay, those could really be reduced to about seven types. And we chose three of those types and said, let's cost out what it would mean to move in this direction. Ultimately, somebody was gonna have to make the decision 
we're going in this direction. So we looked at three, we costed it out, we costed out three, and ultimately what I recommended to the board was a four college structure that differently organizes these programs. So you can see that the recommendation involved a college of media, arts, and humanities. These are not real names. These are just sort of lists of stuff that's inside the, pro inside the college. Health and science, so you've got all your basic sciences as well as your um, applied um, health sciences, information sciences, and business administration, and social policy and social science disciplines. So this was the recommendation that went forward to the board. The board approved this, and now we are in implementation. Now, one of the recent decisions we made, at the time that I made the recommendation, we didn't actually say, would these be schools of media arts humanities, or would these be colleges? We decided that we're going to pursue um, changing our name to Simmons University, and that we would have colleges inside the university. And that that would allow us to preserve some of our signature strengths, like a school of library and information science inside a college of whatever we actually name it in the end. Right now, we're just, that's just a placeholder, right? The business administration and um, information sciences are together. And you might wonder, well, why are we putting those things together? Um, one of the reasons for that particular marriage is that we recognize that we have incredible strengths in the archives and traditional LIS side of the, um, of the School of Library and Information Science. We have incredible strengths in the leadership and organizational behavior sides of our, of our current School of Management. But the place where these intersect, if you were to draw a kind of Venn diagram, would be around analytics, would be around information science. And that's where we have less strength and where we have a real opportunity to grow. So that's what we're hoping we'll be able to make happen in a college that respects the fact that we continue to offer a wide range of programs in these different areas, but that we also want to grow our analytic capacities, our, our, uh, our information sciences. So this was the recommendation that was made. And I, I literally was in Chicago with a napkin, and I drew this picture, which I then just turned into something, you know, that was an image uh, 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 on the computer. I drew a square. I thought, okay, if I've got four now instead of five, I can come up with a, a way of thinking about that. And I thought, okay, how do I reimagine Simmons? Well, I, I put those four new colleges or schools in the corners, and I thought, well, what are some of the priorities that we've had around here that we have trouble actually realizing? That we care about preparing women in STEM disciplines. But we have some of our STEM disciplines in the School of Library and Information Science, and we have some of them, you know, elsewhere. Our biological, chemical, you know, physical sciences are in one place, and our computational sciences are in another place. But what if we sort of thought about that square as something that we could we could work around? That we would say, well, we want arrows that help people who are in information sciences and business administration to think about their connection back to nursing and health and natural sciences in one direction, but that then we also care about communication and, uh, and cultural production, and that that's part of what we want to make happen um, around the other corners. So this was my first conception as I was trying to say, trying to do what a lot of you probably do much better than I do, that is to come up with a visualization of what it is that I'm actually trying to make happen. And so I thought, what if I could make that thing uh, three-dimensional? Oh, a square could become a cube. So I got kind of excited by the idea of the cube, and I started to, to think about it. The reason I was excited about it was that a cube has four sides, obviously, and then it has a top and a bottom. So it really has six. But it also, it really, you look at it and it is a whole. It's not about the sides, it's about the whole. So I thought, okay, what do I now think is happening here? So the base is the undergraduate college. That's where you start if, you, if you're thinking about um, any verticality. You have an undergraduate college, and if you have four colleges that link to the undergraduate program, every side is connected to the base. And then you start putting your colleges around on the sides. They're all equal, they're all equally important, 
they take up the same amount of space, they're all equally connected to the undergraduate program, and hopefully then they're also connected to the grad programs at the top. So now you have this cube that starts to represent what Simmons University might be about. And then you can start thinking about how do I make things happen around the corners and not only inside those sides? Because the sides are, you know, we don't want to go from five silos to four silos. We want to go from, you know, we want some transparency. I mean, that's why I tried to make this cube something that you could actually read across even as you're looking at it. If you're looking at one side, you still see across to the other side. So media, art, and humanities connect to information science as a business administration through these priorities around communication and cultural production, and they connect on the other side to the STEM disciplines. And then you can see how nursing health and natural sciences are about not only what they are about, but also about interprofessional health, which links them to social work. And interdisciplinary and intercultural studies around this other side. So these arrows are intended to be thought of as going around the entire cube and going in either direction. So how do we promote that interdisciplinary effort? I also wanted people to think a little bit about the cube having opportunities that allow undergraduates who are at the base of the cube to rise through the cube and to think about having the graduate programs made more visible to them. So it's not that our undergraduates should all go to graduate school at Simmons, but at least they should know something about the kinds of disciplines that they might be being prepared for as undergraduates. And we do have three plus one programs in fields like political science that allow students to go from an undergrad major in political science to a graduate program in the Master of Public Policy, or as you know, computer science at the undergraduate level to the Master of Library and Information Science. Do all our computer science students want to do that? Absolutely not. But some of them might say, wow, that was not even something I recognized as something I could be aware of. So we want the arrows to go around the cube, but we also want the arrows to go from bottom to top. And then, as I told the community, there's some other ways to think about these cubes as well. For example, right now I've got the undergraduate program at the bottom and the grad programs at the top. You could also think about the fact that sometimes a program is at the top of the world. You know, maybe social work and social sciences are enrolling tons of students and we're feeling really good about these programs. And then a decade later, those programs are not very popular. We have to have a structure that lets us ride out those waves. And one of the things that I told people when I showed them this was, you know, nursing, uh, our nursing program Undergra at the undergraduate level, last year when our, when our students walked across the stage at graduation, we graduated over 200 nurses out of a class of 425. In 1990, anybody want to wager a guess as to how many nurses walked across the stage at commencement? Just a guess? What if I put a dollar up? 300? You think it was more? What do you think? 400, okay. Well, 13. 13. Yes. The fact is that in 1990, Simmons might have made a decision to just close its nursing program. Everybody was closing nursing programs. My previous institution closed its nursing program that year. BU closed its nursing program in the 1990s. But we put a stake in the ground around nursing, and today we have robust enrollments in nursing. So I wanted people to think about the fact that the sustainable structure has to be about how do we keep, keep Simmons moving into the future. So to summarize, the cube. We want things. We want we want uh, efforts that are moving around the cube. We want efforts that are moving moving up and down the cube. And we also have certain priorities that we want to intersect the entire cube: inclusive leadership, social justice global citizenship, these are all really important, not just to any one college, but to our entire institution. And so that's what really makes us, ultimately, Simmons University, and we recognize that becoming a university assists us in a number of ways. First of all, we know that, uh, that students at every level believe that a university has more to offer than a college. 
And we know that some people don't even apply to us because they want something that they think is a little bit bigger and different and better. And we also know that international students understand a college to be a high school. And we want to ensure that we can recruit some of those international students and have them recognize us as what we are, which is really a small and vibrant university. So that's just a quick summary of what we've been doing with um, academic redesign. The last thing I want you to be aware of is a real estate endeavor that we are involved in right now at Simmons. This map should look familiar to you, but let me see, can I think? Yeah, so here we are on the academic campus right now. We are in the School of Management building. Here's the Palace Road building that the Library and Information Science program is in. And in red I have here our current Park Science Center which is wildly out of date, which is just, you know, was built before the advent of the personal computer, which was, you know, it's simply not able to serve our science students well at all. And over here, we have an entire residence campus that's probably not very familiar to most of you. We have a handful of uh, LIS students who actually lived on campus briefly, but um, not everyone uh, would know that residence campus very well. What we did just recently, and this is public uh, knowledge, so I can tell you um, as much as I can tell you at this point, is that we engaged a real estate uh, development firm uh, to bring us bids on uh, a number of ways that we could do what we're calling recapitalizing our campus. We're essentially saying we have this land in the most desirable, one of the most desirable real estate markets in New England. Are we making the most of it? We have about a hundred million dollars of deferred maintenance on that residence campus. We don't want to go have to just repair those buildings one at a time. Is there something we can do that would give us the kind of residential experience for our, um, primarily for our undergraduates that we want to have for them, that would give us a new science center, and that would give us an infusion into our endowment? And we've put this out to bid. We expect those bids to be coming in before the, uh, right around the beginning of May. We'll be looking at the final bids. And we know that BU recently put 660 Commonwealth Avenue up for the same kind of long long-term ground lease and got $134 million for their land, which was smaller than ours. So we're talking about a really bold move here that would potentially bring us the kind of infusion of capital to allow us to do some really exciting things on this campus and to ensure that we are really preparing students, uh, preparing Simmons for the future. So you might have read about it in the Boston Business Journal. It was written up just um, a week or so ago. And uh, at that time, the report was saying, you know, Simmons could probably expect to bring $144 million or more in through this real estate deal. So it's a very exciting move. It's going to enable the kinds of things that we're, you know, dreaming about right now. And um, I thought as, as alums of SLIS that you would be interested in knowing more about, um, about this effort and just being aware it's out in the news and keeping your eye out for what actually happens when May rolls around and we see those final offers and we decide either it has to be a transformative uh, uh, amount of money or we're not doing it, right? So, so that's sort of where we are right now. So, Stay tuned. We would use that uh, capital investment to build a new science center, to upgrade our residence facilities, and as I said, to, to put um, more cash in our, in, our, in our endowment to ensure that we're telling the world that we intend to be here for a very long time. So um, that's my update. Uh, I mean, would you like me to take questions or would you like to keep moving? <coughs> Uh, say more about this. I'm not sure that I understand exactly what would happen. The, the, the physical buildings would stay. No. So, okay. So, um, so uh, I could give you an example, but this is just one example. Okay. So, one example would be that we would say this entire red area. Someone offers us. I don't know, 134 million, just like being you, right? Um, and they, they offer us that and we say, and they say we want a hundred year ground lease on that. So we are not selling it, it remains ours. In a hundred years, everything on it is also ours. So we either renegotiate with them, but we let them do anything they want there. They tear down the residence campus and 
they built whatever they high end you know real estate, um, a hospital, whatever it might be. Um, we so this is just one example, right? Let's say then we say, okay, we're going to build in in the SOM building or in the Palace Road building. We're going to we're going to renovate and expand one of those buildings, yeah. and we're going to um, uh, put science in that building. Right now, a lot of people aren't aware. We rent out a lot of space in this building. We rent out space in Lefebvre. We rent out space even in the main college building. So. We'd be saying, we're probably going to take all of that back because we're going to need it to house everybody on campus. But this is no longer, we're not using this anymore. And right here, we're going to tear that down and we're going to build a high-rise residence hall. I mean, this is just an, an example. This is the most extreme example, right? Build a high-rise residence hall right here that has everything in it, including dining, including, you know, sports facility or whatever. And um, and we have to and we have to figure out how to get science into something here, right? Somewhere on, on the land that's left. So that's the most extreme that we would consolidate everything on the academic campus. But we don't we don't want to go to these real estate uh, developers and say that's our idea. We want to, we want you to tell us how to get everything on one because they might have a much better idea. They might say actually this site is a lot more um, uh, interesting because. Uh, Harvard Medical School, which has some buildings right here, wants that site because of the proximity. So, um, so can can we develop that for um, Harvard Medical School, and maybe they, maybe they take the whole thing, or maybe they say you can have the first four floors for your science center, and we'll build everything that we need on top of it. Um, and then maybe they say, and then we're gonna like take, we're gonna take this section right here. And we're going to develop high-end real estate, and then you can have this back here to build your high-rise residence halls. And so, they could bring us any number of possibilities. And we're trying to say, let's not foreclose. That let's. These are the people who are very imaginative about looking at land. Let's see what they bring us. Yeah. But do I correctly understand that after 100 years, and 100 years seems like a long time, but I actually know someone who recently died who was an undergrad and. The tens. Yeah. So people do live a long time. So 100 years is within our mental horizon. That at the end of 100 years, if they build high-end housing or high-end real estate that was rental apartments or something, it would revert to Simmons, and Simmons would be able to use that. In, a, in any way that they wanted, or to recap, to go back through the exercise again and say, you know, either you re-up your lease, um, you know, whoever you is at that point, um, or. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna tear down. We're gonna let somebody tear down those buildings and start this process all over again. So, yes, Barbara. So the undergraduate college is uh, shrinking and is expected to uh, expand to more than more. Oh no, the undergraduate college has grown. So the undergraduate college, we've had our this is the last two years, the largest enrollments we've ever had in history. 492 students in the two years ago. 472 last year. We're on track. We're trying to stabilize at 425. We would like to have classes of 425 and to have 1,700 undergraduate students. That's kind of the, the sweet spot for Simmons. Um, so we know what number of beds we would need for the, for the kind of residential model. Our students don't all want to stay on campus for four years. They want to get out and live in apartments and, and that kind of thing. So they often live on campus for two years, some of them one year, some of them three years. We require them to live on campus for one year. So it's only the residential piece that we would be saying, you know, let's replicate that, you know, the number of beds that we currently have, maybe a few more, and then let's, but, but, but do we need to do it in buildings that are, these buildings are all four floors at the max, I think. It's a very low build for this area, and so we could get a lot more in a, and, and frankly, some of our students, you know, we, a lot of people say, oh, but people come here for that street, the residence campus, you know, it's, they, they love the fact that you get the, you know, the urban experience, but you go home to this nice little New England quad. But some of them don't come here because they actually want an urban experience, and they want the U or Northeastern or something else. So, we, you know, it's a trade-off. But I think good, clean, new, you know, updated facilities in any configuration are probably preferable to what we've got right now. And uh, that's So no, the SOM has not closed. The SOM uh, 
we continue to offer an MBA and we continue uh, online and a healthcare MBA. We also have an, un an undergraduate Bachelor of Science and Business Administration program that we are you know, really investing in and wanting to grow. We added an accounting major this year. We haven't had accounting as a major before. We have, we're much more management focused and less finance and accounting focused. And that's part of the change that we're trying to bring about um, as well. And lo a lot of students coming in next year are interested in accounting. So, so we will continue to have business programs, but in the, um, in the model that I showed you, we are retaining the names of some schools and not the names of others. So um, we will continue to have a School of Library and Information Science inside whatever we call that college, but the School of Management is really, it, it is small enough that we just don't think it's a school. It's going to be, become a division of business administration or something, it'll have a name, I'm not sure of that yet either. Well, I'm trying to wrap my head around the fact that you can envision not having a building of No. And I'm not, I'm not getting it. I, I know you must have extra room in this building. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but it's just, let's say, coherence is not there. Right. So. Graduates will come to Simmons. They they can take a major in one that happens to be housed. The fact they were housed in one college, and they can take a double major with faculty you know, in a department that's housed in another college. The whole curriculum is open to them. And one of the things we're trying, frankly, to do at the graduate level is to open the curriculum more too, so that we can say, let's say you come here for um, library information science, and, but what you really want to do is also you know you're moving to be a director of a library. That's where you want to go. You could, we want management courses to, you know, to infuse the management courses that we could have taught by people in the School of Management um, into that program. You may be a social worker who wants to go back into a community where, you know, your concerns are about childhood obesity. You could take nutrition courses and other courses in our health sciences that would let you kind of tailor your curriculum a little bit. Uh, so right now we have something like 44 different price points. For our, for our programs. I'd like to simplify that and say, if you're here for library information science, but you take an elective in management, you pay your same rate that you paid in library information science. You don't have to pay a different rate somewhere else. And just make that work differently for students. There will never be a point when we don't have a science center. So I, I want to be clear about that. Either we will replace the science center right on its site here, or we will expand and, um, and uh, renovate another building on this campus, uh, on, this, uh, on this campus, because we're not wedded to having this become <coughs> residential. We're, we're, uh, what we told people is we need 1,100 beds right, in, in, in state-of-the-art <coughs> facilities. We need a brand new science facility. And you tell us how much of this land you then where you would put things and how much of this land you would then lease from us and which parts of it for what purpose. Because we also want to make sure that that purpose is consistent with whatever Simmons is about. We don't want to you know, have this residence campus over here with a, I don't know, a, 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 meth, a meth clinic or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right, so I think we're gonna move on, but um, I'll be here for a little while, so if you have any questions, um, let me turn it back over to Dean Okay, by the way, if you haven't already been eating oh. your salads, oh, I, please do, because I think they're coming in to try to get the food. So you, I didn't eat my salad because I knew I was coming back up. <laughs> this evening, uh, I want to honor some of the past deans of our school. And we're so fortunate that they're a part of our community still. James Matarazzo, 1993 to 2002, and Michelle Kunin, 2002 to 2012. I think we'll start with, in order, but 
but you can look up the same. It's okay. <laughs> I want to take you back to before the school had a, a student association and before the school ran the orientation program. Uh, when I was first here as a part-time student, it seemed to me that the part-time students had disadvantage from the full-time students because the full-time students knew everything and could talk to one another all the time. So we decided we would have a student association. That was the decision we made. I left to go to work. I worked from 3 to 11 at the Boston College Science Library. And I came back the next day to find out I'd been elected president. <laughs> Ernest D. Mattia, the president of the Ferguson Library in Stanford, Connecticut, was my vice president. So one of the things we decided was to have orientation so the students would get to know one another because the folks here during the day didn't see the people at night, and I was a night person, didn't see the day people. And in the event. One of the things in orientation that we did was, unbeknownst to anyone, except the people on the board, is we bought five Red Sox baseball tickets, and we take them to under the cheers. Not everyone, obviously, but there were five. So at the end of orientation, we could say, look under your chair, there could be a race baseball ticket. Now, let's flash forward to a couple of years ago. I met the president of Simmons College, who is an alum, uh, of this program, and uh, she looked very pained. I said, what's wrong? And she was having discussions with herself, anyway, about financial problems and possible tuition increase. So I said, you know, I do this all the time. You know what? Red Sox baseball tickets have gone up 40 times. Yes. Simmons tuition has only gone up 20 times. So she said, can I use that? I said, yeah, you're next. Michelle, you had come up with a photo, and I know Candy wants to come up.
the innovations to come. And I just wanted to tell you about a couple of these innovations because we really were early on to do a number of things. So we were very early on to offer courses in special or corporate librarianship. Um, nearly 100 years ago we were doing that. We also had in the 1970s a faculty member, Estelle Jessen, who integrated um, the history of photography into the curriculum here and through her marvelous publications showed us the relevance of images in communication, which we take so much for granted now that was quite innovative back then. And Tom, I think that's so appropriate since you're the honoree tonight that you know you followed in the footsteps of that wonderful history that goes back almost 40 years of which Martha um, continued here. Um, and I also wanted to, I should have done this before, Linda Watkins and I compiled this history in 2012. We spent time in the archives and going through a lot of professional publications, the early um, volumes of Library Journal, and it's really spectacular, all the things that we've managed to do here. Um, <coughs> by um, the Corporate Special Libraries course that was first innovated here with, with Arthur Little and Webster and Stone, um, organizations that don't exist anymore, but any of you who have been out of the corporate world will remember this. 1921. Um, the case method for library management was developed around 1950 by a former director of the program, Ken Schaefer, and, and brought to marvelous fruition by A.J. Anderson. First archives course by Nancy Peace in 1978. First preservation course was taught by Josephine Fang in 1980. I mentioned Estelle Jessam, um, and there are many other examples that I could give here. We excel in many, many different areas, information science, organization, children's literature, <coughs> and youth services, and we had the wonderful opportunity to work even more closely with um, Kathy Garcia and her program when they came into the fold a couple of years ago. We'll hear a little bit more about that program tonight. Um, what are we doing now? Well, I think that the world is, um, the world we live in today is really reshaping cultural heritage institutions. Changes that we couldn't have even ma imagined a couple of decades ago are happening. And you are going to be the people that help shape this new future. Because the, um, the higher, Katie was talking about hierarchy. Well, when I started in the profession, libraries were just about the most hierarchical organizations you could imagine. And those hierarchies are melting away. And people new in the profession are assuming positions of leadership very early on in their career, which I think is exciting for you. You're not going to have to wait 25 years to be a director of an for a library. Um, so that's changing, and the whole interface, what is the role of an information professional now? In some ways, so much more of a Sherpa guide. You know, when I started in this profession, online searching was dial up and very expensive, and you had to book time with somebody to be able to do that. Now people want 24-7 information services. Um, so I won't go into all these great changes, but I think it's so exciting that the profession that you're going into today will even change radically in your time in the field, and I hope that you have an opportunity to be a fiber part of these changes. Okay, so I just want to end, because I know we have a full program ahead of us, by uh, reinforcing what I said before. It was a privilege to be Dean here, and I have enjoyed my many friendships, which I know will last for the rest of my life. And I thank you very much, and I hope you have a great evening. <laughs>
for an accreditation visit that's going to take place in the fall. So that has led me to look at the details of the past seven years and to see just how much we've accomplished, and it's a lot. Great things in teaching, in our student-centeredness. Uh, we've done a lot of innovative things along the way. And we're going to be sharing this report with our alumni and asking for input. And in addition, in the fall, when we have the visit of what's called an external review panel, alumni are going to be invited to participate in that visit. Our board already knows about this, but if any of you are interested, please see Jean and let her know that you're interested because we will have a visit with them and they'll be asking questions. And as Michelle said, we're extremely proud of our alumni and we'll get to that in just one second. I just wanted to take one minute to ask the faculty and staff from SLIS and Simmons, because we have a few of our librarians here, to stand so we can acknowledge you and thank you for all your time. Okay, so just in closing, uh, we are very proud of our alumni, and again, that's, we have a whole chapter on students and then on what has happened to our students since they graduated, and employers help compile an incredible list. Um, so we're really pleased to move on to talk about our award winners, but I do want to note that we have three of our previous Alumni Achievement Award recipients here tonight. Toby Pearlstein, Linda Watkins, oh, actually four, Vicki Smith, and actually Jean Scanlon. Have I missed any of No, I have an evening more <laughs> important announcement there. I have just to serve dinner. Yes. So if anyone is a vegetarian, would you please raise your hand and Laura will make sure that you take the hero. <laughs> We're going to hold a very brief SLIS Alumni Association meeting now. And it's my pleasure to introduce the current members of the board, uh, most of whom are sitting in the first couple of tables here. Um, so would you stand and be recognized? Kim Borelli is our interim secretary. Anna Bagnola is our Bagnolo is our LAS director from the west part of the state. Michelle Brod Micah Broadnax is an LIS director from Boston. Nick Shin, LIS director from Boston as well. And Shoshana Flax from the Children's Literature Program is a director. And we are for the board. We have a few other board members who are not able to join us tonight. Brianna McDaniels is the Children's Lit Director in Atlanta. Derek Mosley, an LIS director, is also from Atlanta, and Megan O'Connor, an LIS director from Washington, D.C. Frances Harrell is our immediate past president. She was unable to join us tonight as well. We've had a great time over the years, some spirited meetings. Um, we now have a full-time technical person with us so that we can communicate with people who are not in the greater Boston or greater Massachusetts area. Now let me highlight one of the major achievements from our past year. Uh, SLIS led the way with uh, the Office of Alumni Engagement to hold a series of viewings of the illuminated manuscripts exhibit that was here in greater Boston uh, over the fall and into the winter. We first went to the Houghton Library, then next to the Boston College Museum, and finally the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And each event was very well attended. We have had over 70 people at each of them. Um, and it wasn't just SLIS people who were there. These were alums from other schools at what I guess we'll now call Simmons University. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> We were very lucky to have Dr. Lisa Fagan Davis, who is an adjunct professor here at Simmons, 
to join us at all of these meetings, and she was able to give some terrific lectures on what we were seeing for those of us who are novices in this field. Our next item of business, um, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to mention one thing. I brought a uh, part of a Boston Globe article from today, actually, Lisa Fagan Davis has mentioned a Metro section, front page of Metro. Um, <clears throat> she was uh, instrumental in finding three manuscripts, or parts of manuscripts, at the DPL. Um, and noticed that there was something strange about each one of them and spent a lot of time investigating to see exactly where they were from, how they got here, and so on. And today, they're on their way back to Italy. And so Lisa was very instrumental in getting that all straight out. Next item of business for our short meeting here is election of new board members. <laughs> Our present board would like to present the following slate of names for consideration for board membership for a three-year term. Please stand when I say your name. Kim Borelli is going to take on full-time the full of secretary. Stacy Collins will be a director at large. Stacy is over here. <coughs> Alex Lent, I'm not sure if Alex is here. Director at large, he is from the western part of the state. And Marty Verso Smolich, another director at large. Is Marty here tonight? No. Well, um, go ahead and be seated. <laughs> Are there any ad additional nominations from the floor? Hearing none, I'll ask our secretary to cast a vote for the slate as I read it. And that would be Kim. You want to give us a vote, Kim? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I'll now ask all of you to say you support this slate by saying aye, or if not, by saying nay. You raise first. Aye. aye. <laughs> So we have a new slate, and welcome to our new board members who will start with us um, effective July 17, and we'll be at our first meeting uh, for the new board year in August. I'd like to thank uh, several of our board members who will be rolling off this, uh, this June. Uh, Nick Chen, Megan from our DC, uh, um, from Washington, D.C., Brianna and Soshana. Soshana is here. Um, and I thank all of them because we've had a wonderful year and they've all given very generously of their time and effort. <laughs> the next item of our short meeting here will be our finances. Uh, we have a position of treasurer on our board, but since we have no funds, we decided that it probably would be worth recruiting a new treasurer, and we will uh, correct our bylaws over the summer. Uh, this meeting, as well as support for our dinner meetings, um, is generous, generously funded by the provost office and from the dean's office as well and are from our generous former dean, Dean Matarazzo, from the uh, proceeds from one of his books. He turns that over to us to keep us well. <laughs> we have a fundraising report that will be delivered to us tonight by Laura Lubin, who is in the back. Laura? partner with the SLIS Alumni Board this past year, primarily on the Illuminated Manuscripts events, as Jean mentioned earlier. 
programs like those and tonight's event highlight the power of Tulsa's community, as you all have been hearing about, um, and its unique contributions to our community here in Boston and beyond. Uh, the Office of Alumni Engagement really looks forward to continuing to partner with the board and the alumni community on unique programs like these uh, to help our alumni remain connected to Simmons and all it has meant to you, as well as all it continues to meet today. Um, in terms of fundraising, I'm also happy to share that our fundraising this year has been on schedule from Swiss alums, and I'd like to thank all of those of you who have made a gift to Simmons. Your donations contribute to keeping Simmons the thriving community that it is, and a gift of any amount makes a difference. So if you have not yet given this year, I encourage you to please consider doing so. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. I wonder if there's any other business that anyone in the room would like to bring up. Jerry, thank you for being a great president. Yes. 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 Um, I think they should be serving dinner momentarily. Um, yes. <laughs> hearing no other pleas for new business topics, I will now adjourn the business meeting and enjoy your dinner. We'll resume our program at, well, it was going to be 7 o'clock. It will be resumed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to move the evening along, so it's time to resume the program with our awards for our distinguished alumni. And I will invite Dr. Amy Patty, the MS LIS Program Director, to come up and present the 2017 Alumni Achievement Award for Excellence in Library and Information Science. Hi, everybody. So, thank you all for being so patient. And uh, I'm really looking forward to presenting this award. So, as our Dean and Eileen Angles have mentioned before, uh, we're going to be giving this award tonight to Tom Blake, who has been working at the Boston Public Library since 2005. Tom, you stand up, and then we're going to stand up to you. working at the Boston Public Library since 2005, where he works as, serves as the, the digital projects manager. He is currently responsible for the creation of beautiful, versatile, and sustainable digital objects for all BPL digital initiatives. Since 2011, he has managed an ambitious project to help digitize collections from across Massachusetts in conjunction with Digital Commonwealth a statewide repository service, and as a pilot service hub of Digital Public Libraries of America. Tom came to BPL from the Massachusetts Historical Society, where he was involved in several digital projects, including the online version of the diaries of John Quincy Adams. He also served as photographer and imaging specialist for nine years at Boston Photo Imaging, and as an archives assistant at the MIT Special Collections and Archives. Tom holds a BFA in Professional Photographic Illustration from the Rochester Institute of Technology. He received an MS in Library and Information Science with a concentration in Archives Management from Simmons in 2006. In 2014, Tom was named one of the Library Journal's Movers and Shakers alongside other library industry professionals for their advancement of the field and commitment to their communities. Because of his devotion to universal access to all of Massachusetts treasured collections, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners honored him with the Anna Elliott Tickner Award during their 125th anniversary celebration in 2015. On a personal note, I think Tom is a great person. <laughs> his, uh, his spirit of collaboration is something that I have always noted. My husband is also a librarian and has benefited from this as well. Tom is very willing to open up the Boston Public Library and what's going on in the back to anyone who is interested. And I think that really invigorates a lot of folks and gets a lot of people excited about the possibilities and potentials and futures of libraries. So I'm pleased to present the 2017 Alumni Achievement Award in the field of library and information science to Tom Blake.
thank you so much. Um, I well, first thank you to the alumni board. Um, didn't know who you were, but I got this email and I was really uh, surprised and incredibly flattered, and I'm really proud of this this award. Um, I'm going to do the proper husband thing and thank my wife. Yay. Um, so you're the first to uh, acknowledge that um, complaining is a very important part of my creative process. And she suffered through a lot of it while I was here at Simmons, trying to write papers after 10 years of not being in school and not having to do homework. Um, I would thank my kids, but they had absolutely nothing to do with this whatsoever. <laughs> All right. um, but to be fair, um, they, they do actually uh, help me think about the future of reading um, at my job. Our house should be a little more. <laughs> um, so I, I want to also start with a bit of a confession, and some, and some of you know this about me. Um, before I came to Simmons, um, I was in many ways a, an, an enemy of libraries and technology when I started. I had actually been kicked out of, of both my high school library and my college library. And I'm not going to go into details about how there was a lot of misunderstandings <laughs> that happened. Um, but yeah, I, I actually not only got kicked out, but I was actually banned from one of them for a little <laughs> So, and then furthermore, and, and this is really a testament to how transformative Simmons really has been on, on my life and in my career. Um, I didn't even know how to use a computer when I started Simmons. And you just heard all the stuff I, I so I work, I, I now do computery things, I do digital things. Uh, I remember walking into Simmons um, one of the first times and going into the computer lab, and I had no idea what to do with the, the right click. Um, I, I didn't know how to use Excel, I knew nothing. So um, none of you have excuses anymore about you know, you know, learning technology. Um, so like I said, I'd really like to thank all of the Simmons, I guess it's Sliss now instead of Gisliss, uh, faculty and staff for dramatically reversing that, that course for me and really helping me understand that we're now working in a field where dramatic change is, is not just happening all the time, but is often very necessary. Um, the library we're at now is undergoing dramatic change. When I first started working there at the Boston Public Library, it was surrounded by very imposing granite plinths. Um, those have now come down, and I, I'm really proud to say that um, I have been a part of that change. It's now a more welcoming, uh, a much more innovative and collaborative environment that we see, and, and it's really symbolic to see that those plinths have come down. And I don't know if some of you know this, but the, those actual granite plinths that used to kind of keep, you know, keep us out are now the pavers that you walk across to get into the building. Um, I would like to directly thank a few of my professors who were and still are particularly inspiring and supportive. Uh, Donald Weber, who is not here. Jeanette Bastian, who is here. Uh, Linda Watkins, who in, I was saying in many ways was, um, even though she wasn't a professor in a class, in many ways was one of my first teachers. Um, I was taking reference with Alan Smith and having come, that was the very first class I, I, I took when I got to Simmons, and having, you know, had, had a, having an art degree before I came here, just the whole idea of bibliography of bibliography just blew my mind. I, and I just remember sitting in the library often, and Linda would come up, and I was probably looking very confused, and Linda would just come up behind me in, in a very loud librarian voice. There was no hushed librarian at all. And just kind of attack me, like, do you need help? What can I do? So, so thank you for that. Um, Jerry Benoit, who is not here, um, and uh, also the late Alan Smith, but also, um, especially in particular, my, my advanced scouting team of Candy Schwartz and Martha Mahart. So they, they actually, in, in many ways, um, I just can't really say enough about like, how uh, your own passion for this profession has had a tremendous impact on me. Uh, I really can't thank you enough for helping me build a career that I really love. Um, many of you know that Martha has been working with us over at PPL. Um, she's been helping us with some uh, major inventory project in our print stacks. Um, we have another one coming up um, with our photography collection, and we're moving on to more special collections. So um, I'm going to end my remarks with another confession, is that I'm secretly trying to turn the BPL into a retirement home. <laughs> so, so, so Candy, you're, you're next. We've already talked about this with the Rare, Rare, Rare Books project. Um, so just keep that in mind. I know you guys, you, you guys, you know, Try to retire, but you cling tenaciously to this, and there will I will make sure that there is a place for you. <laughs> so thank you again, and um, once again, I'm really honored. Thank you very much.
my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Mercier, Director of the Children's Literature Program at SLES. And she will introduce our next award winner for the Alumni Achievement Award, Catherine. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. I'm too short. <laughs> That's okay. Some things have never changed. Um, at first, I want to say that children's literature came into the library science umbrella in 2013. And as we um, begin to embark on the new redesign that Katie described earlier, this is kind of a bittersweet event for us because it is, I don't think it will be our last event with you here, but when we came into um, the Graduate School of the Graduate School of Library Information Science, Eileen Abels and the faculty and the students and the staff, um, everybody in that building at One Pals Road opened their doors and their hearts to us and they invited us to participate in this. So we have a grand total of two alumni awards <laughs> last year's and this year's. So we, you know, again, this is a, a bittersweet moment and a celebration for us, but I, I don't know how many opportunities we'll have to say thank you. So I want to say thank you to all of you, our colleagues in SLIS. I don't know where we'll be living next, but the door is open. Come over, sit down in the book nook, read a book, have a cup of coffee. Love to see you. So I am personally very proud to present the 2017 Alumni Achievement Award in Children's Literature. Um, again, we've only had one other award, and that went to Vicki Smith, who is, who is here tonight. And we are, I will get Tracy Vance, why don't you come up, Tracy? <laughs> I will get Tracy's title wrong, and somebody else had to write these notes because I never get it right. To me, Tracy Van Stratton is the queen of children's literature at Scholastic. And that's how we call her in our office. We call her Queen Scholastic. So, it is simpler. But for the, you know, for the sake of um, clarity here, Tracy um, is vice, was vice president of publicity in children's trade book publishing at Scholastic and served as its Vice President of Publishing and Education Library Marketing since December of 2007. <coughs> she joined Scholastic in 2006, where she and her Cracker Jack team have created national publicity campaigns for books on bookshelves near you, such as Matthew Reinhardt's number one New York Times bestseller, Star Wars, A Pop-Up Guide to the Galaxy, Maury Sendak's first pop-up book, also a number one New York Times bestseller called Mommy, the 20th anniversary of the Magic School Bus series, and the award-winning and best-selling illustrated novel, The Invention of Hugo, Hugo Cabret by Brian Selznick, which is a personal favorite of mine. Tracy also served as director of publicity in the children's publishing division at Simon & Schuster, and she held similar positions at William Memorial Company, at HarperCollins, and at Little Brown. She earned her MA in children's literature with us in 1996. Now, Tracy is a particularly deserving of this recognition for many, many reasons. But the top one for me, especially with this audience, is that Tracy loves two things more than her child. <laughs> right? Maybe the same as her child. Maybe both. Depends what they are. One is books, and the other is getting good books to librarians because librarians get good books to kids. So I can't think of a more deserving honoree for this, our second <laughs> alumni <laughs> to award in children's literature than Tracy Van Stratton. Spending the last 25 years publicizing and marketing children's and YA books has been a lot more fun than it has been work. I once had to fill out a Q&A that asked, if you won the lottery, what would you do? 
And I responded, I would read as many books as possible and then tell lots of people about them. And then I realized that's basically my job. <laughs> my favorite thing in the world is matching a book with the right reader, be it a child, a reviewer, a producer, a reporter, a librarian, a bookseller. My colleagues call me a book matchmaker. No visitor can leave my office without a book, and nothing makes me happier than hearing I've made a successful match. I've had an amazing career journey so far, filled with incredible opportunities and quite a bit of luck along the way, and one of the earliest and luckiest of those was discovering Simmons. I started the Simmons program in 1993, when I was working as a publicity and marketing assistant at Little Brown & Company here in Boston. I had recently moved here from my home in Chicago with the goal of landing a job in children's publishing. I always tell people the children's book part of my career was deliberate, but the publicity and marketing part was a happy accident. I simply took the first children's book job that was offered to me, and I loved it. Once in Boston, I looked into some master's in English programs, but none of the courses appealed to me, and simply felt like revisiting what I had just studied in college. Then one of the editors at work mentioned she was studying at Simmons, and she loaned me her printed course catalog. <laughs> I wanted to take every class in the book. When I told my boss at the time that I wanted to enroll in the program, she couldn't understand why I would want a master's in children's literature. She said, you're in marketing. If you want an advanced degree, you should get an MBA. This program is for editors. I understood her point of view, but I didn't agree. I didn't embark upon the program with any set goal of professional advancement in mind. Publishing is more or less an apprenticeship field. Um, and while it's true that I didn't need masters to move forward, and it's possible that I might have ended up where I am today without a degree in children's literature, I believe that I'm better at my job because of Simmons. Through these many years in a variety of positions at five different publishing houses, my roles have expanded from publicist to department head where I'm involved in every aspect of the publishing cycle, um, from the acquisition of new books to strategizing the most effective ways to market and publicize them. At every stage of the process, it's essential to understand the context of where these stories or voices fit into the publishing continuum. <coughs> what makes something truly groundbreaking versus a mashup of other successful books? It's Twilight meets the Baltimore stars. It's Wonder with dragons. Um, enthusiastic editors and agents are always quick to rave. There's never been anything like this before. Um, it's very, been very useful to have a broader lens from which to judge whether or not this may be true and to know when you have something truly special like Olivia or Click Clack Moo or the invention of Hugo Cabret or The Hunger Games or George on your list. Though I completed the program more than 20 years ago, I find myself remembering and referencing my courses on a regular basis, studying Picture This with Molly Bang, taking Mark Aronson's fascinating course on the history of children's book publishing, reading the bodies of work, and then meeting Emmy Kerr, Russell Friedman, and Julius Lester, researching back issues of Publishers Weekly and seeing display ads just like the ones that we place every week, introducing Dumas, The Three Musketeers. Um, conceiving and writing flat copy for a fictional picture book and pitching it to reviewer Roger Sutton from the Horn Book and bookseller Terry Schmitz at the Children's Bookshop, and so much more. These formative experiences were the perfect foundation for future jobs that put me in daily contact with every aspect of the publishing industry, including reviewers, media, booksellers, librarians, teachers, authors, editors, and more. But the class that had the most unexpected impact on me was the fantasy and science fiction course. I dreaded this required class and put it off to the very end because I hated fantasy and science fiction. Or so I thought. We had a small and lively group, and somehow my avowed dislike for the two genres uh, were revealed really early on. And then a strange thing happened. I absolutely loved a lot of the books we read. What began to mystify all of us, though, was that there appeared to be no discernible pattern to what I liked. I liked some stories about time travel, but not all. I loved some books set in space or faraway lands, but others left me cold. I responded favorably to some books populated by fantastical creatures, but not others. My classmates and I were so perplexed by the randomness of my reactions that I decided to write my final paper on why I liked what I liked, to see if I could find any sort of common denominator. And I did. I had known vaguely, but through this exercise, determined that I am first and foremost a character-driven reader. It doesn't, if I'm not invested in the characters, it doesn't matter how lyrical the writing or expert the world building. I am just, I don't respond. What I observed is that many writers of genre fiction invest a lot more time and energy in the creation of their worlds than the characters within them. And that's precisely where they lost me. All the books with which I connected either had excellent character development from the start, or they let me spend some time getting to know the characters before the magical or fantastical thing occurred, at which point it was too late and I was already invested. <laughs> This may sound like a truly self-indulgent exercise, however, it really clarified for me my own strengths, weaknesses, and blind spots as a reader. This has been invaluable as I've been tasked to weigh in and evaluate books through my career and create large-scale publicity campaigns for them. 
My experience helped me to separate my personal taste as an individual reader from quality, appreciation, and potential audience. And I've learned that just because a book's not for me doesn't mean it might not be exactly right for someone else. I'm often asked if I ever have to do publicity for books I don't like. Well, the answer to that is all the time. <laughs> but that never diminishes my ability to pitch all of its excellent qualities and to the right outlets. Liking a book certainly enhances my passion for a project, but not connecting with it personally is irrelevant to my ability to help find the book its best audience. I've also discovered that when I or my colleagues get excited about a book that's not generally in our reading wheelhouse, it's a sign the book may appeal to a wider audience than its usual demographic. This is exactly what happened with The Hunger Games. While I can't say I'm a fan of dystopian fiction in general, I still have the deliriously enthusiastic email I wrote to the editor at 1 a.m. when I first finished reading the manuscript. My colleagues and I were all unanimously and instantly obsessed with that book. As a group, we usually tend to like different things. There's the Star Wars guy, there's the rom-com contingent, the literary middle grade readers. Um, but because The Hunger Games appealed to each and every member of our team, regardless of usual reading taste, we knew we had a book that could transcend its genre. This had a huge impact on how we decided to market the book, including the now iconic cover, which helped launch it to success. Within the first month of publication, just some of the media outlets who reviewed The Hunger Games were Entertainment Weekly, Newsweek, Seventeen, Romantic Times, USA Today, and the top sci-fi websites and blogs, echoing the identical diverse response we experienced in-house. When I began the Simmons program, I did not have a crystal ball to inform where my publishing journey was going to take me, or how and when my course were work would weave its way into my professional life. I could never have imagined at that early stage in my career how many of the literary luminaries from my syllabus, not to mention my childhood, I would later be lucky enough to meet and help introduce their new work. Susan Cooper was very amused to learn that I'd written a graduate school paper on The Darkest Rising. <laughs> I first read the late great Walter B. Meyer's Fall of Fallen Angels at Simmons and later found myself the publicist for both its sequel and prequel more than 20 years after its original publication. After reading Talk Everlasting in that infamous fantasy and science fiction class, I later worked on two books with Nat, the late Natalie Babbitt. Equally exciting, though, is introducing the world to a brand new voice, artist, or character, or helping an author grow over time from a promising debut to an award winner and media powerhouse. During my time at Simmons, I was the only person in the program who did not have plans to teach, write, edit, or become a librarian. I don't know how much that's changed overall, but based on the requests I get for informational interviews from Simmons students, I'm encouraged that more alumni are considering careers in publishing and beyond the editor's desk. The possibilities are limitless, and no matter which path we pursue, Simmons Children's Literature alumni are each links in the chain of putting books in the hands of children, and that is the greatest honor of all. And so thank you so much again, and congratulations also to Tom, and thank you. evening I'd like to take a brief moment to thank the people who were so instrumental in putting this evening together. First, uh, our friend in the front row here, our visionary dean, Dean Abels. Dean M. Claire Knowles, without whom I don't know how I get through a regular meeting, let alone a meeting like this. Laura Lubin is another person who is really instrumental in putting the evening together. And Nick Chin uh, from our board was uh, instrumental in putting together appetizers, drinks, main meal, anything that you can enjoy tonight. Thanks also, Drew. Thanks also go to the students and staff who were taking care of things at the front table. And uh, I think that's all we know. Oh, no. I have to remind you that the mugs on your table are your gift from us to you and the careful opening the paper because there's something on the inside as well. 
And before you leave, you might want to check underneath your chair, anybody that has a red bag under their chair. Oh, under your mug. Oh, under your mug. I'm sorry. Um, we'll take home the flowers that are on your chair. Thank you all for coming and have a safe travel home.